know that you can edit video just by moving text around, by moving blocks of text around? Well, now you do. And the man who makes it possible is here. We're going to talk to him in just a few minutes. We've got a lot going on today. StreamYard Connect. Let's do a show. <laughs> Hey gang, Ross Brand here for StreamYard Connect. We're here every Wednesday, 2 p.m. Eastern. So glad you could join us. I see Scott Ayers is here already. He says he's very interested in the software. And uh, Sue Ann, great to see you. She says, happy Wednesday, Ross. Uh, buenos tardes. Como estas? Thank you. Uh, Christian is here. And... Uh, a whole bunch of people are here. I'm not going to get to everybody. Tim Sohn dropping in from Pennsylvania. And somebody else they were watching from Scotland, from Bonnie, Scotland. Stuart. Stuart, good to see you. Uh, glad to connect with you on Facebook not too long ago. So we're live on Facebook. We're live on YouTube, on the StreamYard channels. And, of course, we're also live on Twitter on the iRoss brand account and a lot to talk about. Uh, I am so excited. I've been looking forward to this day for a while because as anybody knows, transcribing video, transcribing audio is a challenge. If you tried doing it with a YouTube transcript, if you tried doing it with some free or inexpensive solutions that are out there, you know that it takes a long time. And sometimes you wonder, <laughs> would it have just been easier by the time you're done cleaning it up? Would it have just been easier if you had just listened to it and, <laughs> and typed it up yourself? Of course, it wouldn't be quicker. But the point is, it takes a long time. Simon Says is the company that our guest Shamir comes from. And they have really gotten transcriptions down with such a level of accuracy that it makes it easy to clean up that transcript and go ahead and publish that with your video or use it to guide your production of what you want to look for in the audio and the video sides. But now it's getting even easier because you can mark those clips and move them around. We're going to talk to them in just a few minutes, but I couldn't resist playing this video. So check this out. It gives you a real taste of uh, what we're going to be talking about. that music too i feel like eric b and rakim are going to come out or something i'm really dating myself now so we have shamir alibi here and we're going to talk to him about simon says and about his new product assemble which is text-based video editing and and don't forget next week we have superstar rapper and actor and now tech ceo ja rule joining us and we're going to talk to him about his new app icon as well as plans for 
a live streaming component called Icon Live. We'll also catch up on the music industry and what he's been up to. Maybe take a look back as well. Ja Rule joins us in the guest segment next week on Wednesday here on the StreamYard Facebook page and StreamYard YouTube channel. Meanwhile, Hoppin, the company that owns StreamYard, has been in the news a whole lot lately. And here was a story in in Cheddar. In fact, the CEO of Hoppin, Johnny, uh, was on Cheddar the other day. And Johnny Buffett was talking about the valuation of Hoppin. That's what they had him on to, to talk about, which is what you talk about when you talk about that. And... Uh, in addition to saying that at least for a year or two, he's looking at Hoppin remaining a private company, not going for an IPO yet. The the story was that the valuation of Hoppin is more than doubled in the last four months. So it made me think, what what happened in the last four months that could have had something to do with it? Well, let let Johnny tell the story as he did on cheddar we've been growing at uh an, a, a pretty fast pace so we've uh we've made an acquisition of a, a video production company called Streamyard, which uh it really complements hopin uh it provides us with uh, a better experience for our users and uh w- from from the time uh that we raised our last round we were at uh 20 million in annual recurring revenue and today we're over 70 million and uh, around 74 million in a- a- annual recurring revenue compared to uh when we raised around at 70, uh, the, the most recent round. So StreamYard, which was doing about 30 million in annual uh, recurring revenue, uh, it now is a part, of course, of Hopin. And people may be wondering, virtual events, of course, there's Zoom. A lot of folks use Zoom. Why would you choose Hopin instead of Zoom? Zoom is great for, uh, and, and video conferencing tools are great for uh, a zero to 20 person uh, call. Uh, the, 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 the thing about them is that you can only have one person talking at a time, no matter how many people are there. Now with Hopin, what we allow uh, organizers to do is truly create an event where you can have multiple breakout rooms. You can have polls, you can have Q&A, you can have rooms that have tons of integrations. For example, if you wanted to have game rooms in your event, if you're running a conference or a workshop, uh, if you wanted to have face painting, literally the, the, we, we, we try and just provide you with a venue and you can have, uh, you know, it, 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 for anything over 40 people, you're able to really break people out, create multiple sections of the event and really just create uh, all around an experience that works really well when you're doing anything for more than 40 people. And if you've been watching this show for a while, you know that whenever the issue of live streaming and the pandemic comes up, I've always talked about the pandemic being an accelerator, but things were moving towards live video anyway, and this just sped up the process. So, of course, I was delighted by Johnny's answer when he was asked about the impact of the pandemic. I think it's just accelerated uh, what was already happening. I mean, last year... We, we, the majority of our uh, wait list when we were uh, about to launch was mainly organizers and conferences that wanted to hybridize their events. It, it is unnatural to have an event that, uh, you know, most organizations and communities ha- are, are global nowadays. And, and typically the organizations that run these events have gl- global audiences for the event, but yet they're running them in, in one location and they're only getting 1% and it's a huge cost and uh, the value of them is, is very hard to track, etc. So. Um, Hopin really was initially a hybrid and virtual platform where you would have that one event in person, let's say in New York, but you'd be able to bring in everybody uh, through a virtual layer on top, everybody to be able to watch uh, and, and attend and network and truly engage from wherever they are across the world. Fantastic interview uh, with Johnny Bufferet, the CEO of Hopin on Cheddar. I'm going to put a link to that interview in the notes. Thank you to Cheddar for uh, just that great interview and a lot of wonderful content. I highly recommend checking that out when you have a chance. So one one of the reasons why uh, Hopin has been in the news is in the last week they announced their Series C funding and they did their series B in November it was 125 million and now for their series C they've raised 400 million and so to look at the 
really ex- unbelievable growth of this company. Hoppin was launched in March 2020. Its valuation in November was two billion. It's now up to five point six five billion in March. Again, StreamYard purchased. In January, the announcement was January 7th. I know because I was uh, (laughs) finding out that I had a broken arm at the time when the announcement came in. So I I probably won't ever forget that date for two reasons. Um, And as uh, Johnny mentioned, the the, uh, annual recurring revenue, which was $20 million in November, is now up to $70 million. 80,000 organizations are using Hopin, while StreamYard brings 360 million creators. So it's an exciting time for StreamYard, an exciting time for Hopin, uh, both live streaming and virtual events, live virtual events, and also hybrid events when we go back to having in-person events are all going to be a huge part of of how we communicate, how we do business, how we gather, how we socialize, how we interact and build community. So uh, something to watch, but exciting news for the Hoppin and StreamYard family. And also for StreamYard creators, you've been asking for this for a while. Uh, The announcement was made Sunday night on the town hall. Gage and Dan, the co-founders of StreamYard, talked about multi-track recordings coming to StreamYard. Essentially what that means is instead of getting just one recording that has both you and your guests all mixed together on that recording, you will now get a separate audio recording for each person in the conversation. So what that means is if people talk over each other, if somebody has uh, a, a a lot of noise coming out of their end, you can you can just use the track of the person speaking in that position. I'm not sure that was perfectly described, but point is podcasters love this. Audio pros often use multi-track. Uh, it's something that's been requested a lot. Let me just say that ideally you want to set up your audio so you don't need to rely on multi-track. This should be a nice to have, not a weekly necessity if you can set up your audio to where you and your guests are are fairly level and both people sound good, then go ahead with that mix track and save yourself the time. But it's a great feature. It's highly requested and it is on the way. So we look forward to that. There's also talk that there'll be separate video uh, of each person on the broadcast as something to come as well. So that's another thing to look forward to if you haven't checked it out yet do check out uh the predictions blog that we did at live stream universe a couple members of the Streamyard team are featured in it many Streamyard users and uh users of a lot of the great products we had uh, over thirteen thousand dollars worth of giveaways that we gave at the live event and we had uh, 13 brands who, who contributed, and it was an amazing, amazing time, and a lot of uh, great professionals uh, contri- were, were there to give predictions and to talk about what's going on in the industry, and you can check that out at LivestreamUniverse.com, LivestreamUniverse.com. Just scroll down. Uh, you'll see a picture of uh, you know what you see here on the screen, a collage, and you click that, and it'll take you to the article. You can find people you know, people you like, and you can see what they have to say. Maybe learn about some new people who are creators and entrepreneurs as well. And, of course, if you're not yet using StreamYard, come on. It's time to do it. It's time to make the jump. If you use the link, LivestreamUniverse.com StreamYard, you can get a free trial of the premium features and see Uh, which of those features work for you. Uh, There's also a free plan, but once you get a taste of those premium features, you're going to love using overlays and backgrounds and a whole bunch of different ways you can enhance your broadcast with StreamYard. Again, LivestreamUniverse.com slash StreamYard. So now the moment I've been waiting for, let's bring on our guest, Shamir Al- 
alibi. <laughs> I knew I was going to get it right or wrong. Not positive, but he'll correct me. Shamir, welcome to StreamYard Connect. He is the CEO of Simon Says. It's an AI transcription platform. His new product is Assemble, which is focused on text-based video editing. He's brilliant. He's got a master's degree from Harvard. He started out working in media. He's worked for BBC. He's a documentary filmmaker at heart, I think, still, because once you get the bug to do that, it's much like being a a broadcaster. I worked in radio. I got done with radio. I was done for about eight years. I stumbled into Blab, and here I am live streaming (laughs) ever since. So uh, let's start there, Shamir. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about how your career started in the media before you develop this this great solution that you have. Thank you so much for having me, Ross. And I'm so, so, so excited to be here in part, in part, because Ja Rule is also going to be on the show. And while we're not going to be on the same show, I love Ja Rule. I love Ja Rule. I started dating myself. But I remember listening to his tracks back in college. So, you know, I think it'll be like a, a bucket list check mark right there. And awesome. uh, congratulations on on the growth of the company and, and obviously your your success, your success with Hopin and it sounds super exciting. I think it is a incredibly um, wonderful time to be a creator and how the economics are changing and the opportunities for a creator. And it's almost been a silver lining of this pandemic uh, when people, when I see how, how creators have been so indomitable, uh, tenacious, resourceful, uh, creative to try to uh, make things happen uh, in spite of the situation. So yeah, thanks thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I started my career, yeah, exactly, at the, at the BBC. I, you know, I remember when I was a young boy breaking every single camcorder I had in my, in my, in my family's house, uh, the VCRs, trying to like cut things together. Oh my God, it, it, yeah, my, my mom definitely has uh, some, <laughs> some horror stories from those days. And I think I always like, yeah, truly just very much saw the world in stories in, in a visual storytelling lens and uh, documentaries were or was where I spent uh, the first chunk of my career. Uh, it was a lot of kind of post 9-11 world stories. I spent, you know, it was based in London, uh, spent a lot of time in the greater Middle East in some time in Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, South Asia and East Africa. So, you know, it was very much focused on that kind of larger region there. Um, and and uh, it's been been an amazing experience, and I sort of look back with a deep fondness. And yes, still still making documentaries. A, a year a year and a half ago, I made a documentary about my dad's life. So cut cut together home videos, but it was his his uh, big birthday, and I uh, showed my uh, 10, 15 minute documentary on his life, almost to celebrate all his accomplishments. Is, um, is that online uh, or it, was that just for the fans? It, it was just in front of, it was just, uh, he had a party for a hundred friends, which was amazingly impressed. I don't know if I could even fill a room with a hundred, but uh, it was, yeah, he had a hundred friends uh, at a hall and I, and I played it out there and obviously got it transcribed with Simon Says. So the first question that comes up in my mind is 2001, 2002, were yeah. you shooting digitally at that time or were you still using uh either film or vhs no digital it was all digital oh yeah absolutely yeah yeah absolutely very much so and um it wasn't that i didn't work on any film projects i remember this one indie film project when i um i'm originally from canada but after college moved to london and um at this really talented uh, Japanese director and, and we shot a fun film on, on Super 16 film. So, you know, we were definitely like still working on that. But for all the documentary work, absolutely, it had definitely moved uh, to digital. So I suppose that your founding of uh, Simon Says might have had something to do with finding a solution because As tough as it is, let's say, for a YouTube video or a one-on-one interview, with a documentary, you have so many interviews. And then those interviews all have to be clips and they all have to be arranged and everything. So 
a transcript yeah. is almost essential or you're yeah. going back and you have to keep what wait what did i put here okay i got to watch that Absolutely. again and i got so it, it, did that did that lead you to, to think about 100%. Uh, simon says yeah. i had done uh, Absolutely. Like uh, this company we, we started it four years ago. Uh, at the time, I actually, it was just like a personal problem I had. Um, and so over the last eight years, I have my career is to being a video tech entrepreneur. Four years ago, I was working with Facebook Oculus on a project and, and you know, kind of related project. I had dozens of hours of footage that need to be cut down to two minutes. And I couldn't believe that we still had to use human transcriptionists sort of reminded me of my original career and and you know it was a kind of pain point because it was slow it was expensive like a, you know i remember shooting an interview or a bunch of interviews in afghanistan and it was a, it would have been amazing if i could have just transcribed it and translated it uh, so i could even understand it and to be able to start editing it right away but i had to you know i obviously did the interview there uh, a week later, you know, we'd get back on a plane, we'd go back to London, find a translator, then to get it translated, and then to like be able to do something with it. And so it was sort of like harking back to my original career. And I thought, you know, I have Siri on my phone. Right. Why can't I use speech recognition to just transcribe this? And so it was sort of like something I hacked together initially, um, <laughs> using speech recognition to transcribe for that particular project. And it worked not bad back then, you know, four years ago, it was sort of something simple. And, and, and Simon says was birthed through that. I shared it with friends from my original career and sort of like got spread, it spread it and, and it has really grown from there. Well, I've heard from people who are, you know, very active users that they say that the accuracy, everybody claims 99% accuracy, <laughs> but there's yeah. still a difference within, within different products why yeah. why are people so high on simon says what yeah. is different about maybe how the transcription works how you use artificial intelligence or what the yeah. the end user ends up with after they yeah. get that transcription yeah absolutely i would look at us as very much a full stack application focused on video professionals. And what I mean by full stack is, it's not just a speech recognition engine, but it's the entire layer from, from uh, that AI all the way to the top. So as a video professional, you can drop in almost any audio video file format or codec, um, get back a transcript in almost every language, any language on this planet, a hundred languages we support, you can edit it, you know, we, we, you know, you can amend it, you can annotate it, you can uh, use bookmarks, you can invite your colleague to that project. Um, and then once you're ready, you can hit export and get back obviously for Word and, and, and some basic formats, but you can get it for uh, an SRT caption file, web VTT, and, and most importantly for every single video editing application. So where the transcript attaches to the clips in Adobe Premiere Pro, for example, or Final Cut Pro. And so we're making it like so simple for any video professional um, to, to support any format that they shot in and just get back to their editing application super easy, super seamlessly. And so we wanna make it almost like uh, effectively foolproof and seamless in their workflow. And I think that's really been the magic of it. So Simon Says lives as a web application. Right. It's got this editable transcript editor, but we also have extensions that live in the video editing application itself. So it makes it easy for, for anyone working in on a video edit, on a video project, on a right. documentary project even, to, to just you know import their files, uh, get back their subtitles, get back their captions, get back their transcript, and go about uh, doing what they really love which is not to focus on this tedious, on the on the min mundane, but right. to focus on how to bring the story to life. And that's what I believe we're enabling. And that's what I think our users have really gravitated to. Is, is your primary user um, a video professional or are there hobbyists, prosumer type people, people who are, you know, part-time creators, maybe they have a side business doing it, but uh, or is it big production companies and 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 big time professional broadcast organizations? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we started with pro video because there was three particular challenges they needed 
um, and that we had solved, right? And so one was like just being able to support um, a kind of breadth of audio video formats and codecs that pertain uh, to this area, to this uh, industry. Um, There's a couple other challenges that we saw that were really difficult, but they're really critical to these workflows. And so we started there, but those same, um, you know, the same sort of solutions we came up with for the pro video, pro audio industry are very relevant to everyone. And so we have a lot of uh, prosumer uh, video creators. Like I'll give you one example of something we solved, which pertains across the board to anyone creating video. We're not doing just time based uh, transcripts, which means seconds. Uh, you know, a transcript denoted right. in seconds and milliseconds. It's time code based, which is a frame accurate a way to mark the transcript in and out points. And this is super critical. It's not. It's mandatory for for the pro video industry and the and you know and anyone working uh, professionally, but all the way to you know someone just shooting as a hobbyist and editing in Final Cut Pro. And so um, you know today we have um, you know users who work at big studios who are using us on Netflix uh, episodic series on HBO documentaries. For ABC documentaries, um, I think we've really, you know, it was really important where we started um, because those innovations were still are applicable across the board. So one of the things that I noticed and, and it motivated me to ask that question, I didn't see an integration with ScreenFlow or Camtasia. Is it that most of your user bases aren't using those applications, or is there a, a different reason why? Uh, there's no integration. Yeah, yeah, at this point, you know, a lot of a lot of the direction is like users pulling out features from us and saying, "Hey, hey yeah, it's, you know, it's not about accuracy at all." Uh, you know, when we started four years ago, and and where uh, speech recognition technology was, sure, we were getting questions around, "Hey, you know, accuracy in this language, and, and can we improve accuracy there?" At this point, the accuracy is fantastic. Now it's like, "Hey, can you support this?" application, can you add this feature? And so I, I'll take this as a feature request and pass it over to the CTO to make sure he adds it on the roadmap. Well, to be honest, uh, for me, I, I, but yeah. I know there's a lot of Camtasia and ScreenFlow users. And I've, I've been using ScreenFlow for probably three years and I use it all the time. I used it for the clips for this show and yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I'm also tempted to try Final Cut Pro at some point. So yeah. I, I don't know. What do you, I mean, you've worked with all the different ones. Do you have a go-to for your for your own editing that you say, this is my favorite or this one works with my operating system? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So I started in Final Cut Pro, uh, it feels like almost a decade and a half, decades ago. Uh, when they moved to Final Cut Pro 10, you know, like everyone, we sort of like, they just <laughs> changed the application and how to edit videos so dramatically was very painful for us uh, who, who love FCP. Um, and, and I moved to Adobe Premiere Pro at the time. So, uh, but at this point, I, I've grown uh, more affection for FCP again. And so I use both actually, it depends on specific use case. What has surprised me, uh, and it was really birth. Uh, or like bored out of conversations with our users, but uh, a lot of users have been talking about uh, 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 Blackmagic based out of Australia, their video editing application called DaVinci Resolve. It's a really like high-end video editing application, um, but it's free. And it's really unique in, in you know in this in this industry you you know video editing application you you pay you pay for and almost usually right. these days on a subscription um, and so a lot of users you know maybe that was that was why they were first introduced and tried Resolve but a lot of users have really liked it I've been playing around a bit with Resolve I haven't cut anything or finished anything on Resolve right. yet but I've been meaning to. Yeah, a lot of good options. Uh, we're yeah. talking with Shamir and we're talking about Simon Says. We've been talking about the transcription side mostly. We're going to get to yeah. the uh, text-based video editing in just a second. I, I am aware that there's a little bit of uh, audio issues, and I'm trying to uh, go back and forth. For those who are StreamYard users, you have the ability to turn on and off echo cancellation and turn on and off volume adjust from auto. And so uh, whenever I'm here... 
something that isn't as good as we would want it, um, I've been switching back and forth, and that seems to solve the problem. But unfortunately, leaving it on just one setting, uh, whichever setting that is, isn't, isn't totally solving the problem. However, I hope you can hear okay and that you're getting the value from this interview because it, it's a huge honor to have Shamir here. And we now want to move on to uh, the great, the amazing text-based editing function. Tell us a little bit about this, where the idea came from, and uh, who, who has been making use of it so far and what the reaction has been. Yeah, absolutely. If there's anything I can do uh, with respect to the audio on my side, let me know. Um, what, what happened was a couple, of, like a year and a half ago, we started to we felt like the transcription side of the application had been um, addressed. Uh, solved is a big word, but like a lot of the kind of large challenges we were working on, at least had been addressed, and there was a bunch of things to still do. Um, but what we were hearing from users, kind of over and over was they loved the accuracy of the transcript. They were inviting users to their own teammates, their own clients even, to go through the transcript, be able to highlight you know, key sound bites. Um, but what they really wanted to do was not just get a transcript. What they really wanted to do was find the meaningful parts in an interview to then order those sound bites forming the spine or the foundation of their story. To think, you know, hey, we with AI we have uh, word time reference points. What that means is, what that means is, every word in the transcript has a specific point in the video. So, with with Simon says, the transcript and the video uh, are inextricably linked. Right. Um, and what we said is, hey, there's an opportunity here that if users are wanting to highlight those key sound bites. Uh, we can facilitate it that they could just like drag and drop those sound bites into a particular order, forming the spine of their story. And that's really what Simon Says Assemble was kind of uh, through these conversations with our, our users, our customers, um, you know, was the, the kind of pathway of like, hey, we can allow text based video editing. So again, just like highlighting you know, key sound bites in your transcript, being able to order, just drag and drop. Uh, what we wanted to do was you know, really reduce the technical barrier to being able to edit. What we're seeing is non-editors who were once precluded from the step of uh, needing an editor to start creating that rough cut um, are now being able to edit video themselves. Uh, it's like a Google Docs where you can have multiple users uh, in the project, editing the transcript, uh, creating the timeline, creating the foundation of their story. And, and we're seeing like significant or hearing from our users significant improvements on efficiency and speed. And we're really excited by uh, where this is all headed. That's nice. And uh, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, when I edit video or before that, when I would edit audio, uh, you... You have to find where you want that sound bite to start. Then you have to yeah. play it. You have to mark the in time, the out time, come back to the in time, and yeah. then make make sure that you cut it precisely yeah. so that you get the start at the beginning of the sentence. Or you, you know, yeah. somebody says uh, a couple times, you want to try and cut that out and start right with this is the answer, right? So yeah. um, how accurate is it now if you just look at the transcript and – mark the words yeah. that you want to be the first word and the it's last word. word. First of all, which is why it's so painful. Again, again, <laughs> taking like my, my original career in doing that mundane scrubbing of audio, trying to find in and out points. And uh, oh, I really, really, really want to never right. do that part ever, ever again. Uh, it's incredibly accurate. It's incredibly accurate. The word time references are incredibly accurate. Uh, all you have to do is highlight those key sound bites. So, you know, if I'm interviewing you and I wanted, you know, to skim through the transcript and I found five sound bites that, you know, say create that I think would create a wonderful story for a two minute video. Perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, I can just like highlight those five sound bites and then drag and drop them into the order. Uh, and instantly there's no rendering. There's nothing to wait for. There's no lag. The edited video dynamically and instantaneously forms. And again, you can invite your colleagues 
can get, invite teammates. I can get a number of people in this project uh, looking at it. We can all agree because creating this rough cut is it's oftentimes the most sensitive part. You know, hey, you know, this line from Ross, you know, is this the right line? What about this other line? This might be uh, a better line to communicate what we're hoping to to tell in the story. Um, and so this like rough cut stage is actually a very tedious, time consuming, sensitive part. And you need a bunch of people involved. But because of the, how it's being done currently, before Simon Says Assemble, is um, a, a uh, you know video editor works in a application on his or her computer, right? You know, creates a cut, exports that cut, and then either shares it on a cloud drive in a video commenting tool, solicits feedback from uh, his or her teammates, a client, gets those notes, implements those <laughs> notes in a new cut, right? Uh, exports it again, and this whole cycle of sharing, get feedback, implement feedback continues. And now that feedback loop is either in, uh, uh, significantly shortened or completely eliminated because the video editor and the commenting are now together. It's browser based. Anyone can jump in. They don't need a video editing application on their computer. It's in the browser. Um, and anyone can leave comments. So you can leave comments and you can say, hey, I, I think this shot is, or this quote is sensitive. Let's look for an alternative. You can leave comments like that, but you yourself, as a video editor, are now a video editor. You could actually go through the transcript, find alternative sound bites, and just bring it onto the timeline yourself. Again, this is text-based video editing. So it's as simple as a Word processor, as Microsoft Word, a Google Docs. Um, and, and we're excited by you know all, all we're hearing, both for like uh, professionals, video editors themselves, but also um, their colleagues who aren't uh, trained editors, who never thought of themselves as editors, who are now able to edit. Yeah, so it's wonderful for collaboration and it makes it yeah. easy for, like you said, non-editors to add their input because yeah. they may be excellent storytellers, but they may not be prepared to sit down and play clips and move them around. But sure, drag and drop, they can yeah. probably handle that. Absolutely. Um, so you've got your clips selected. Yeah. And now, you know, whenever you're making a video, there may be time issues, okay, within the clip, if I can cut a few words out or I can cut part yeah. of a sentence, or somebody goes off on a tangent and comes back and you realize, okay, I can yeah. save a minute if I clip that out. How is the editing within uh, yeah. those rough cuts? Is that better to do it in, can you do that within um, Assemble or do you need to go to your editor to do that? Yeah. Great question. So one of the things I think users also really, really appreciate by Assemble is it's really about aligning on rough cut, you know, getting everyone, all your teammates, your clients, you know, really aligning on the foundation of your story. Um, again, this is the most tedious part for an editor, you know, finding in and out points, scrubbing through audio. Now that you, once you've aligned on the rough cut, you can anytime go back to your uh, original video editing application. We have an export that goes right into Final Cut Pro. Uh, you open up that, that project and it seamlessly reconnects with the original media. And so the timeline or sequence or the rough cut you were seeing in Simon Says Assemble is now the same thing that you're seeing in uh, Final Cut Pro. Um, if you use Adobe Premiere Pro, same thing. This sequence, the timeline is uh, automatically recreated uh, as you were looking at in Simon Says Assemble. And so you can do that fine cut, the polish cut, you can pick B-roll shots, use your existing plugins, the kind of tools to bring the story to life, your color correction, your color grading tools, add titles, add credits and export. So you can complete the film right. in your existing video editing application. It's really to solve the rough cut stage, um, you know, of creating the story spine. And that's then you go into Final Cut Pro, Adobe, yeah, and, and exactly. DaVinci Resolve, and you, exactly. you make those razor cuts, so to speak. Exactly. You, you make yeah. the fine cuts. That makes total. Yeah. Pick total the B-roll shots. You know, like your your beautiful cinematic drone shot flying over the city. Uh, that's where you would 
do that do uh, those types of uh, bringing that story to life. You know, this is really about let's pick the key sound bites in the correct and order them in the correct uh, in the desired order to like form of your story. Now, for people who uh, do, let's say they they do a live stream and yeah. they want to put a transcript on their website for accessibility. Uh, yeah. Perhaps people who are hearing impaired would rather read the transcript. Perhaps people want to read the transcript at work when they can't be yeah. listening to audio out Absolutely. loud or for whatever other reason. Some people do it for yeah. SEO. They feel having the thorough transcript makes a, uh, you know, a blog post that gives that gives Google yeah. or one of the other search engines a lot to pull from. Absolutely. What is the process of you've got the transcript to yeah. getting it ready to post on your yeah. website as yeah. part of a blog in, in, in written form? Yeah, really great question. There's uh, three primary ways we see uh, users doing that are able to do that. One, um, you know, you uploaded your uh, video, you get it transcribed, and now you can get captions that burn into the video itself. And so it's uh, obviously helpful for accessibility. Um, number two, um, none of these are mutually exclusive, but number two, you can get the text. Um, so you get the transcript text, you can export it to Word, uh, you can copy and paste it and then paste it into your, your blog site alongside of the recording. Uh, number three, you can publish a Simon Says transcript and um, then this uh, published project is uh, embeddable into your blog. Um, you can still get that uh, transcript video inextricable link. So forward in a transcript text, it jumps forward in the video. When you jump back in the video, it jumps back in the, in the transcript text. Uh, you can embed that published project in your blog as well. So there's three ways to do that. Our friend Brigetti says she's wondering if there's possibly a Bluetooth issue that could be causing that the rumble that, that people are hearing. I'm jumping back and forth from settings, and whenever mm -hmm. I change settings, it, it usually kills it pretty quickly. Um, so uh, I, I'm try we're trying our best, folks. Yeah, um, my, my, mic's not, my mic's not Bluetooth. My, my mic is a Are, a are your USB headphones one, so. Bluetooth? It's an, my headphones are, but it's not using the mic from the headphones. Oh, uh, okay. I, I guess that I don't know if there could still be interference or not, but um, the, see, this is why a transcript will be great, right? We'll have a <laughs> yeah, transcript exactly. of this. And multi-track and... audio is actually helpful for, for transcription. You get a better accuracy. So I heard you were talking about multi-tracks earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so you actually run each transcript through uh, on its own, right? Like you run rather each track through by itself if you want to. Yeah. And, and then you can pick up some, some words that might have been lost when two people speak over each other. Yeah. I mean, what we find is that in a two-person interview, usually it's an interviewer and an interviewee. The mm -hmm. interviewee is the key one. And so they uh, usually just focus on the interviewee's audio recording to get the transcript of. Right, right. Uh, okay, so... Now we've got we've got all these different possibilities. What are some yeah. use cases that have come along for yeah. Simon Says or for Assemble that you could not have imagined people would do when you created the products, but somebody just surprised you like, oh, that's not something I ever thought I'd see anybody do. <laughs> Good question. Um, from what uh, a user told the other day, I think it, they were trying to cut not a nonfiction piece of content, but a drama, a kind of episodic TV series. This is like very high end. And it was surprising to me um, that they were using Simon Says to do that. But I think the use case there, and that's really where I was surprised, was like um, they had done numerous takes, numerous takes uh, for this uh, fictional scripted story. And now, uh, in part because of the pandemic, or, or primarily because of the pandemic, their team, uh, their production team was remote. And so they wanted to use Simon Says Assemble to find the key takes or the best takes to like form 
uh, their story. So that was surprising to me. You know, I definitely knew in, in the documentary world, if you're doing a product launch video, a web video, a video for social media, you know, those were, those were imagined, but, uh, this was definitely a novel one for me. Wow. So yeah. talk about, um, as a, as a startup founder, how you've been able to grow the user base. Is it through advertising? Is it through building community? Is it through word of yeah. mouth? What has been, uh, some of the key factors in your growth and stability as, as, as a company? Yeah, I'll tell you, there's, I have two answers, right? One, um, you know, I wish I had understood this earlier. I was so focused on just building product and solving, uh, the challenges that we're seeing, you know, Simon says, you know, AI transcription, captioning, translation for video professionals and, and solving the kind of problems in that space. Um, and, and it took me a couple of years after, you know, working on the product for a while, like, Hey, I really need to switch my mind over to the business building part, not just the product building part, but the business side, the business building part. And, you know, really thinking about how users find out about us, you know, how, uh, word of mouth spreads. And so today Simon says is, uh, very much, um, driven by organic growth. We've never done any paid marketing. Uh, it's been. Um, primarily word of mouth or just inviting other users. Um, and, and I think that's, um, you know, I can see that continuing for, uh, for some time in the future. I think the kind of most basic and my number two answer and the kind of at the most basic level, uh, that I think about a lot is how can we make our users, our customers incredibly happy? And I think that's a very obvious statement, right. but, um, tough to put into practice day in, day out. You know, just very much focused on our users, um, what will help them, what will speed up their workflow, what will help empower them in the story that they're trying to bring forth. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, you know, I, myself as a creator at one point still am. Um, and so I know the challenges in bringing forth your story and telling stories and putting out your work. Uh, it, and it's really Simon says his job to help facilitate that, make that faster, make that better. And so that's really what we, how we see ourselves in, in this, in this, uh, as a product in our customers workflow, make them happy, um, you know, make them work together better and faster. The website is Simon says dot AI, Simon says dot AI. Um, what can people do who want to get started, try it out? Yeah. How, how do they go about signing up yeah. and what kind of, uh, either trial or, or first plan? Yeah can they do to get a feel of, of how it works? Absolutely, there's uh, free credit when you sign up. So we really encourage users to just try it, try it with your own files, uh, make sure you're happy with it. Uh, ping us if you have any questions, there's FAQs and um, video demos. So feel free to watch those. Um, but uh, yeah, you just try it and, and play with it. We really want users just to experiment on the Simon Says Assemble side. The website is edit.simonsays.ai. And there's a demo project, so you can just cut. It's me doing a walkthrough demo of the product, so you can just cut that video and and create a a shortened version a time on the timeline side. And that'll walk you through actually how yeah. to use the product exactly while yeah. you're cutting up the video about how exactly. to use the product. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't make me say anything bad or funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. We can change your words. <laughs> no, we wouldn't do that. It, it's so great to talk to you. Um, yeah. I apologize uh, for a, a, a little bit of audio issues that we've had, but it, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank and, you. Uh, let's get a transcript so anybody who yeah. missed anything can can go to uh the blog when we post it we'll post chapters on uh on youtube and people can go and listen or read about uh simon says and assemble thanks again shamir it's wonderful yeah. to will connect you, with you and and will you say hi to ja rule for me at least like, absolutely can, yeah absolutely i'll tell him you said yeah. hello <laughs> <laughs> Good. And then I'm going to transcribe that and then put it on uh, Simon Says uh, yeah, and post it and send it to all my all my college buddies. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you so much. Super. Great Thank you. Have a great rest you. of your day. Absolutely. Bye. That, that is Shamir Alibi. He is the founder and CEO of a great app, a great website. It's really a browser based 
solution called Simon Says. It does great AI transcription, but also provides the ability to edit by moving around text rather than by uh, actually cutting the video when you're doing the rough cut editing. It's a, it's a wonderful way to go about and it's going to speed up the time to market for a lot of documentary filmmakers, everyday creators, and a lot of different people who want to collaborate and work on projects that require a ton. Again, it's Simon Says dot AI. I will put the link in the chat. Give me one second. Simon Says dot AI. Head on over there and check it out. Uh, and you can see the link will be in the chat. It's also in the description on YouTube and on Facebook. And we want to tell you about StreamYard's lineup of shows. Uh, when we go off uh, in just a few minutes, those there's a lot more to watch if you're part of the StreamYard family or you want to learn about StreamYard. We've now got a full lineup. Of course, the town hall is every Sunday night. Gage and Dan, the co-founders, Take your questions. They share what's going on as far as new products, new updates, new features. Check that out. Bring your questions. And throughout the week, there's an entire lineup of shows by the StreamYard team. And also, we have creators on YouTube. Nick Nimmin, D. Nimmin, Daniel Battelle, Roberto Blake, and Sean Cannell of Think Media. So look for their content on the StreamYard YouTube channel as well. We'll be back next week with Ja Rule. Need I say more? Uh, you know, I always say you have to tell what the value uh, that the guest brings unless you're having somebody famous. Well, next week we're having somebody famous. So I can just say, join us next week. We're talking to Ja Rule. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Can't wait to uh, hear what he's up to with his icon app and where his plans are for icon live and a lot more so thank you all for being here uh thanks again to shamir alibi from simon says check it out simon says dot ai and have a great day everybody <laughs>